Good morning, everyone. There's a story told of an American soldier who had drawn remote duty and had written home to his wife telling her of his seven new friends with whom he had developed a close relationship. I am so grateful, he said, because in this isolated and barren land, a person could easily have been driven to despair. When his next birthday rolled around, there was a large package in the mail from the States. When he opened it, he discovered not one gift, but eight gifts. There was one for him and for one for each of his friends. The soldier looked at the eight presents and with tears rolling down his cheeks, exclaimed, that's my wife for you. Yes, sir, that's my wife. The wife was revealed by her actions. That was the kind of thing that she would do. That was indeed her nature. That's what she was like. Today, as we pause at the beginning of Holy Week, we look at the cross and we recall the whole story of pain, suffering, darkness, and death. As we gain upon, gaze upon our king, arms spread wide and in forgiving love we proclaim, that's our God for you, yes, that's what our God is like. Palm Sunday, the people of Jerusalem were more than ready for this day. They had been waiting for this day generation after generation, reminding themselves of God's promise to their land and their lives. They were waiting for that one person who, would, who would send, God would send, who would lead them into a new era, a new life, in which they would be free from the powers of this world. On that day, on this day, the city of Jerusalem would welcome Jesus as that person. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That would be their cry as he rode on a colt, as the people threw palm branches on the road in front of him. He would deliver them, and they would indeed follow him. What was it the people saw, or better yet, wanted to see in Jesus? His disciples and those who followed him were not military leaders. When the crowd came out that day to see Jesus enter Jerusalem, they were carrying palm branches. Palm branches were a symbol of nationalism, like waving an American flag as a parade went by. But palm branches were certainly not good weapons if and when the time came to take back Jerusalem from the Romans. What did the disciples want to see in Jesus? What did Peter see that would make him proclaim that he would never desert Jesus? What did Judas see in Jesus that would make him follow him and ultimately betray him? And what did the people and the disciples see in Jesus that would make them deny him, desert him, betray him, and finally crucify him? What would cause the people who gathered around him when he entered the city on Palm Sunday to turn on him so quickly? Was it Jesus who had changed that much between the time he was hailed as the son of David and the time of his arrest and his trial? Jesus may have been arrested and tried, but it was really the people of Israel who were on trial that day. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he was warned by the Pharisees to silence his disciples and those who followed him. But he would not silence them. He would allow them to testify. When Jesus was being taunted by the guards and the soldiers, he did not silence them. When he was being taken to the place where he would die, the crowds gathered to hurl insults and when he hung on the cross, he was mocked. Those final days and hours became a courtroom scene in which the people were put on trial and they testified against themselves. Let us look for a moment at our lives and put ourselves on trial just a bit. When have we declared our loyalty to a person, a team, or a party, only to back off when there were questions, or when they were losing, or when we felt disillusioned or disappointed? When have we run away and kept silent as someone else was falsely accused or hurt who could not defend themselves? When have we joined in by poking fun at someone who was different than ourselves, rather than separating ourselves from those who would demean that person and defend them? What we do today is not only to tell the story of an innocent man going to the cross, 
but it is through the liturgy we reenact the trial of all people, including ourselves. The trial begins with our reading from Isaiah, where God asks that we present our case. The Lord says, declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. We do not have to say for ourselves, is not God God? Has God not protected us in the past? Did not God feed us and nurture us? Is not God our God? He asks us, why have we separated ourselves from him? Why have we not acknowledged who God is? And why do, not, why do we not humble ourselves in his presence? God tells us that we confess him with our lips, but deny his rule by our lives. We have indeed all turned away. In Jesus' death on the cross, we are found guilty. No one came forward to rescue Jesus. No one stayed with him when he was arrested. No one could be found to defend him. Yet we thank God that the story is not over for us, for you and me. We are found guilty of separating ourselves from God, of betraying him and ourselves. The sentence is not what we deserve, which is death, but rather that we need to live. The cross of Jesus is not a sentence of condemnation for those who are separated from God, but rather an instrument of forgiveness and of mercy. Jesus pronounced the sentence himself when he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus forgives us, and he asks God to forgive us also. We deserve death, but God spares us because he knows who we are and what we are capable of. When you and I come forward to receive the Eucharist in a few minutes, we are being offered the very life of the one who died for our sins on the cross. God not only has forgiven us in words, but God has also given us new life as we share the body and blood of the one who died for us. Palm Sunday is a difficult day that begins a difficult week. We are asked to look into a mirror and see who we are and what we are capable of, both the good and the bad. We proclaim our loyalty, only to see that the loyalty is as fle as, as fleeting as we betray one another for our own safety, and then, like Peter, run away in the time of trouble. These are not things that we like to see in ourselves, and certainly not things we wish to talk about with others. But we share them with each other as imperfect, fallible human beings. Today and Holy Week is not about us. It is about God's unconditional love for each and every one of us. It is about a God who longs to be in a relationship with each and every one of us, just as we are and as he created us to be, and by what great measures he is willing to go through to see that that happens. Palm Sunday and Holy Week are about a new relationship with God that is made possible only by God's love for each and every one of us. As we enter Jerusalem in Holy Week, we enter with humility, with joy, and with thanks. We are humbled because we see ourselves in the persons of Peter, Judas, the soldiers, the crowd, Caiaphas, and Pilate. We have a sense of joy because we know how the story ends as we see the power of God working in and through our weaknesses to make us his new creation. And we are thankful because we are saved, not because of ourselves, but in spite of ourselves, by a loving and caring God who will not let us go regardless of our sins. Some years ago, a new pastor was called to a spiritually dead church in a small Oklahoma town. The pastor spent the first week calling on as many members as possible inviting them to the first Sunday service. But his efforts failed, and in spite of many calls, not a single member showed up for worship. So the pastor placed a notice in the local newspaper stating that since the church was dead, the pastor was going to give it a decent Christian burial. The funeral of the church would be held at 2 p.m. on the following Sunday. Morbidly curious, the whole town turned out for the funeral in front of the pulpit was a large casket smothered with flowers. 
After the eulogy was given, the pastor invited the congregation to come forward and pay their respects to the dead church. The long line of mourners filled by, filed by. Each one peered curiously into the open casket and then turned away quickly with a guilty, sheepish look. Inside the casket, tilted at just the right angle, was a large mirror. Each person saw his or her own reflection in the mirror as perhaps never before. That is still what happens when human beings allow the living Christ to confront them in their sinful brokenness. This special day calls us to make a choice to receive God's Christ and to let our lives be made whole again by the power of God through the working of the Holy Spirit. As you begin this Holy Week, can you truly say in your heart, blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord? The choice is up to you. Praise be to God. Amen.